Hello and welcome to another Arizona Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with AARP Arizona. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. And with a nationwide presence of nearly 38 million members across the nation and over 900,000 right here in Arizona, we work to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment, to name a few. During the months of May and June, we will focus on healthy living and amplify the call to action for the 50-plus community to develop healthy habits for mental well-being. As the country continues to grapple with the ebbs and flows of the COVID-19 pandemic, many are eager to move into a sense of normalcy. Many in the 50-plus community have developed coping mechanisms that show a strong sense of resiliency and the need to anchor themselves. Ongoing public health concerns, economic issues, and global conflicts are still weighing on older adults. By covering topics like sleep, stress management, healthy eating, and exercise, AARP demonstrates that its healthy living offerings can help Americans develop and maintain healthy habits for their mental well-being. Visit us for resources and information at www.aarp.org backslash mental health or at www.aarp.org backslash Arizona. Thank you for attending tonight's session. Have a good evening. Hey everybody, Marshall Shore, Arizona's hip historian, and I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. But you know, we did pre record this, but we had so much fun that we have decided with Bonehouse Brewery, we are going to do a little Fountain Hills experience. So on Saturday, May 21st at 7.30, we're going to gather in front of the Euro Pizza Cafe, do a walk around the lake and fountain, and then go hang out at Bonehouse Brewery. So there'll be more information coming out on Facebook and Instagram and other sources. See you soon. Well, hello and good evening. Oh my gosh, I am so happy you're joining us tonight because you know why? Background because we are in Fountain Hills right now at a very special place, which we'll get to in just a moment. But thank you so much for being here, everybody. So happy you can join us. And so Welcome to Arizona History Happy Hour. My name is Marshall Shore. And, you know, today is May 12th. And, you know, in terms of what's going on today, well, you know, it is Ev Meekum, who was the 17th governor of Arizona, a decorated veteran and World War II automotive dealer owner. Wait, no, wait a minute. A decorated veteran of World War II. He was also an automotive dealership owner published occasionally a newspaper, and he was born today back in 1924. Now, he is also the first Arizona governor to be impeached. His, his term was plagued with all kinds of controversy. He became the first U.S. governor to be simultaneously faced removal from office through impeachment, a scheduled recall election, and a felony indictment. So also, it is National Limerick Day. Now, most believe that the Irish city of Limerick is where Limerick started, but we really celebrate here at May 12th because of the poet Edward Lear, who really made the Limerick really popular 
and wrote a bunch of them. Now, he was also known for some of them that were rather inappropriate or crude, and that's just the way he liked them. It is also odometer day. So if you've ever wondered how far you've traveled in your car, you can thank your odometer. As well as National Nutty Fudge Day. So, you know, fudge is a sweet, delicious treat that's combining sugar, butter, milk, and heating it. And then you throw in some nuts to make it even more tasty. And there you go. You've got some history right there. All right. So what can you expect from tonight's show? Oh my gosh. We're going to have a little bit of music trivia. We are going to have a little bit of little Arizona talking about a small town right here. Something from the vault. So something you might see every day or just not know what's there or kind of the story behind the story. As well as a beverage because, you know, it would not be happy hour without that. As well as awesome guest and just wait we'll get to that in just a minute but if this is your first time watching you might be wondering who is that man and why is he on my screen well my name is marshall shore and i've been here a little over 22 years i started off back in brooklyn working in a library and decided to trade that carnegie building for a little library in south phoenix that had this rich oral tradition of the community and that kind of got me looking at history in a different way. In fact, and it's now, it was um, a 1950 bit building that's now in a really fancy building. And as soon as we got here, we moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch that is pretty much all original because there's what my kitchen looks like today. Tons of buttercream yellow tile, that yellow in the wall oven. And if you look close, there is no window. Now, as soon as I got here, all I could hear about how there was no history here, but I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, whether it was on foot, on bike, in a car, it didn't matter. I kept coming face to face with so much amazing history. And then there's that post-war boom that brought so many GIs here. Some of them had been stationed here. Some had trained here. Some just passed through the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers, looking for a change of life. And they found it and they changed Arizona as well. I'm also called the hip historian. You might wonder what that means. Well, you know, less, just last week we did Ignite. That was so much fun. So as soon as the video from that is available, I will be sharing that. Ah, oh, and I see some of you have already found the chat session. You know, you can also reach out to me through Facebook, Instagram, email, all kind of hip historian all down the line. Because, you know, I love to hear from you because that's where some of my best stuff comes from, is from you all. So it would not be happy hour if it wasn't for my friend PJ, my cocktail advisor. So that's how I wound up here. So we are talking a little bit about a prickly pear ale. And so, because we're at Bone House Brewery out here in Fountain Hills. And so, you know, he likes to make tasks for me. So I have the fact that I have to peer, peer, pour this without getting too much foam, but enough foam. So let's see how I do. Oh, I should be. Oh, actually, that's not bad. Oh, you know, maybe all that practice that he's making me do is actually improving my pouring abilities. Hmm, that's pretty darn tasty. And so, you know, that's how I discovered Bonehouse Brewery is because PJ, we actually used one of their beers for a prior episode. And so here we are today, hanging out right here. So let's talk a little bit about Little Arizona. So we are going to talk about the little, a little town called Chloride, which has just under 400 folks, was founded in the 1860s and is up in Mojave County. 
And, you know, it started off as a small town and then they discovered that there was silver in them bar hills and it became big business. At one point there were over 70 working mines. And so as you walk around town, you can still see some of those old buildings that have survived and many of them house businesses. Why today, here is yesterday's restaurant, which is kind of an oasis in the middle of all this. They serve up more than 120 beers, more than 40 vodkas, and a quite an extensive wine list. And serve everything from steak to seafood to pasta. So when you're there, you can get a bite to eat. Now you might wonder, what else can you do? Well, there is the Historical Society. They've got a small museum there that you can go visit as well. Of course, there's a cemetery that dates back to when the town was first founded and some really good old gravestones and headstones with lots of history. As well as you can go take a look at in the mid 60s, um, Roy Purcell painted basically 2000 square foot rock of mural. And he did this when he was actually studying art and this kind of helped launch his career, which he's still doing today. He actually came in and painted about 2005, kind of repainted it. Um, it also, as you're looking at that, you'll be next right side, eh, just beside petroglyphs. So, I mean, we know people have been hanging out here for thousands of years. So it's a great place to go and just kind of hang out. It's just a little north of Kingman and a good spot. And there's also some good shop in there as well. Little antique stores. And so now I'm happy to talk about our special guest. So, and why I'm sitting here drinking this delicious beer. All right, so let's bring Rachel on. Hello. Hello, Rachel. How are you this evening? Hi, I am great. How are you? I'm good. It's so good to see you. You too. Thank you for having me on. Oh my gosh, this is going to be so much fun. Let's so, get Rachel, so tell us a little bit about where we are. So we are at Bonehouse Brewing in Fountain Hills, Arizona. Um, we are the only brewery in this town and we make tons of craft beer and we talk about Arizona history all at the same time. Indeed. And so tell us a about yourself. About me. Um, so my background is in art history, history, archaeology, and museum studies. So I also work at a museum for my full-time job. Um, so ah. it really has always been a huge part of who I am and what intrigues me the most. Very cool. Yeah. And so, and I know we've got some great trivia coming up. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do is so when now our tree is a little bit different than if you go to typical bar trivia where, you know, the answer is important, but we give you four choices. So that way you'll know the answers there and then we'll come back and we're going to talk about the answers. And for me, that's where I think all the fun really happens is you get a guess and then you get to find out what the answer is and the story behind it. And that's so much fun. Yes. All right. So our first question is, who was the man responsible for describing the flora and fauna of Western North America, including a cactus now named for him? Was that A, William Bartram, B, George Engelman, C, Henry Muhlenberg, or D, Joseph Suaro. So which one of those gentlemen do you think was responsible for naming the flora and fauna of the Northwest America? He also has a cactus name for him. So what do you think? All right, while you're working on that, we're gonna go ahead and go to question two. What is the name of the man known as the Lost Dutchman. 
Is it A, Jacob Waltz? B, Paulino we Weaver? C, Connor McKellips? Or D, Jack Swilling? So which one of those is the man known as the Lost Dutchman? All right, question three. Which is said to contain clues to the location of the Lost Dutchman's mine? Is it A, the Travis Tollinson manuscript? B, the Peralta Stones? C, the Palomino Mountain Map? Or D, the San Javier del Bach Mission? All right, so what is said to contain clues to help folks find the Lost Dutchman's mind and maybe some gold? All right, question four. Who was Arizona's most wealthy madam who ran a brothel in Jerome at the turn of the 20th century? Was it A, Charlotte Hall, B, Pearl Hurt, C, Donna Lindo, Donna Linda, Cameron, or D, Ginny Baders? All right. So who do you think was one of the wealthiest madams in all of Arizona? All right. Question five. What is the name of the Apache medicine man who was the last American Indian to surrender to the U.S.? Was that A, Geronimo? B, Cochise? C, Carlos Montezuma? Or D, Chief Joseph? All right. So who do you think was the medicine man? All right, moving on to question six. What was the name of Arizona's first brewery built, wow, a long time ago, back in 1864? Was that A, the Park Brewery? Was it B, Dundon Brewery? C, Free State Brewery? Or D, Bayern Brewery? All right, so what do you think was the first brewery built way back in 1864? What was the name of the first brewery in Arizona after Prohibition? Well, you know, and I think that right there deserves a toast. Indeed it does. All right, so was that first brewery here in Arizona after Prohibition, was it A, Desert Brewing? B, Finster Beer Company, C, Apache Beer, or D, Arizona Brewing Company? All right. Question eight. We're coming into the home stretch now. Here we go. What was the name of the Pilsner beer mass produced by Arizona's first brewery, Arizona Brewing Company? Was it A, Lion's Head? Was it B, A1 Premium? Was it C, Primo, or D, National Bohemian Beer? All right. Question nine. What was the most common style of beer served at saloons in 1870 all around Arizona? Was it A, a lager? Was it B, a brown ale? C, barley wine? Or D, wheat ale? What was the most popular and common style of beer in the 1870s? All right. Question 10. How did saloons store their beer without refrigeration? Uh, that's a good question because you know who like nobody likes a warm beer. All right. So was it A bottles, B barrels, C cans, or D kegs? All right, so while you are thinking of your answers and locking in your final selection, we're going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break, and we are going to talk about a jazz genius. She performed for over five decades right here in Phoenix, played all over the country with all kinds of jazz luminaries, and it is Nadine Jensen. Now, her claim to fame was not only she had a great voice, not only the fact that she could play the piano or the fact that she could play the trumpet, but she could do them at 
not all together, but she was known to be playing the piano. She would reach down, gla- grab her trumpet and play it while playing the piano with the other hand. She was played all over the valley. And so, you know, let's hear it for Nadine Jensen, one of those class musicians from our past. So thank you so much, Nadine. Indeed. And, you know, and cheers to Nadine. Cheers to Nadine. Yes. And, you know, it's like, and, you know, and that best of album you can still get a hold of. And I think, I think Nadine is even on Spotify. Nice. I'm going to have to look her up. That's very cool. Yeah. I mean, oh my God. And it's so, it's such good music. And so, all right. So now we're ready for some answers. All right. So, who was the man responsible for describing the flora and of most of the West, Western North America, including a cactus now named after him? Yes, so that gentleman goes by the name of George Engelman. He was born in Germany and he was actually a doctor. He earned his medical degree from the University of Würzburg. And his dissertation was on the morphology of plants um, and how that can be applied to medicine. So he was always very interested in botanicals and and things like that. Um, Ah. Yeah. He came to uh, the United States in 1832 as a land agent, interestingly enough. Um, And he settled in St. Louis and he attempted to open a medical practice there. Um, but he was unsuccessful. So he decided to embark on a different journey altogether. And he came here to the Western United States and he went everywhere from Northern California all the way down into Sonora, Mexico, um, studying and documenting and doing beautiful sketches of unknown plants to science at that time. So he was uh, Pretty profound. Uh, he has a honorary uh, doctorate degree um, from a couple of different universities here in the states. Um, the botanical gardens in St. Louis uh, are named after him. So, oh wow, yeah. So he's a pretty profound botanist uh, in North America. Um, so yeah. And so, what cactus is named after him? So it is the uh, prickly pear, the Engelman's prickly pear. Ah, and that's why we're drinking. Yes. Indeed. That, that is why we are drinking Engelman's elixir prickly pear pale ale. And you guys can see on the screen there, um, there's some can art. Um, so here at Bone House, we like to tie real Arizona characters, people, and history into all of the beer that we make. Um, So there is a- Oh yeah, look, there's a story right there. There's a story on the side of each can that you get that tells a little piece of Arizona history and a little piece of our story, our fictional story that we are always creating and always adding to here at the Bone House. So all of the questions that uh, are on trivia tonight have to do with Arizona history, but also they have to do with our story here at Bone House. Um, So our story here is that uh, our fictional founder, the original brewmaster of Bone House, was the alleged nephew of the Lost Dutchman. And so he is going on many adventures in the Arizona desert, mining, um, and meeting characters such as George Engelman through all of that. So, <laughs> very cool. Yeah. All right. So, speaking of the Lost Dutchman, what was the name of the man that was known as the Lost Dutchman? So, the Lost Dutchman was Jacob Waltz. And he was a real person. There's lots of legends around him, but he was, in fact, a real person. Um, He was born in Germany around 1810, and he immigrated to America around 1839, and he arrived in New York City, like most immigrants did at that time, Um, but he immediately went to the South. He was here to mine for gold, 
So he went to North Carolina and Georgia and mined there. And then he jumped over to California for the gold rush in 1850. And that's how he ended up on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> so he worked in California until 1863. And then he came here with a group of prospectors uh, and they were headed for the Bradshaw Mountain Range, which is uh, near Prescott. Um, after doing some mining there, he came down here to Phoenix and he settled in the Salt River Valley uh, in 1868. Um, and that's where he filed a homestead decree for 160 acres near the Salt River. And this is where he began exploratory prospecting. Um, and he did that pretty much for the rest of his life. Uh, and he died in um, 1891 here in Phoenix on October 25th. And he is legendary because there are ideas that he had found this huge gold, either cash or a huge vein of gold. And that legend persists today. Um, in fact, there are 137 people that have claimed thus far that they have found the treasure, but yet there's still no treasure to be found. <laughs> yeah. And if you do go out looking for his treasure, don't forget to take water. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, and I would say even like one of those like Mylar blankets, because so many folks get out there and get turned around and get kind of lost and suddenly hours go by. So, you know, you better be safe out there. Yes. <laughs> now, I always like to say we don't know where his treasure is, but we do know where Jacob Waltz is. He's buried in downtown Phoenix at their Pioneer Cemetery. That is very, very cool. So people can go visit him and may, maybe he'll tell them. Maybe he'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So people are trying to find his gold. How are they discovering clues to the location of that lost Dutchman's mine? Yeah. Um, so this is a really interesting and I find overall very strange part of the story. Um, <laughs> so, yep. uh, so supposedly there are, well, not supposedly because the stones are very real, but supposedly um, there are sandstone blocks, which you guys can see in the pictures there that have these maps carved on them that pertain to uh, clues and landmarks and other things in the Arizona desert that can supposedly pinpoint exactly where this gold mine is. Um, so the Peralta stones are uh, or they represent areas of land that were perhaps granted to a very wealthy Mexican family, the Peralta family, um, that would have been, uh, they were granted land from the Spanish crown for mining purposes. Um, so these stones are a series of coded symbols that can be used to decipher the desert and landscape and where supposedly this gold is. Um, so the stones themselves are a set of three sandstone slabs and a fourth heart-shaped rock, um, which is weird and interesting. Um, there's engravings on both sides of the stones um, with images and symbols and numerals and misspelled Spanish words. All right, so let's think about that for a second. Um, so the stones are inscribed with the date of 1847, um, and the stone heart fits perfectly into the slab that has the heart shape, you know, carved into it. So it's like you place it down in there. Um, one side shows a priest um, who's assembling all of these stones, supposedly creating the map that's going to show you the way. <laughs> um, and then on another side, there is what they call a horse map, which has a horse image drawn onto it. Um, the priest stone uh, says in Spanish, um, to find the gold, you must find your heart. So that's also kind of weird. I don't know. <laughs> um, the most often heard story of the origin of these stones is that they were found in 1949 um, off of US Highway 60 near Florence. 
by a random man who was vacationing with his family. <laughs> um, another story suggests that uh, they were stolen from a church basement in Mexico and then sold to somebody here in Arizona. Um, many people think that these are complete fakes. Uh, it's just a spoof. Um, as the engravings, they appear to be made with modern power tools. Um, there is misspellings of the Spanish words. And actually, the heart symbol that we are very familiar with today was not a thing um, in 1850s uh, Spanish maps and things like that. So there's a lot of weird questions um, about them. Um, they have been on display twice, uh, one in 2009 and one in 2012. Um, and they are part of a permanent museum collection. So all sorts of weird stuff surrounding these things. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And you know, I mean, when I was in libraries, it was the most commonly asked question. Interesting. People, yeah, I mean, there's slews of books about telling you exactly how to find the gold. And it was funny because at one point I was talking to the folks out of the Super Sh Mountain Museum, mm -hmm. and they said, well, you know, we have stories about people who would move those landmarks to try and throw other people off, uh -huh. but then they forgot where the landmarks were originally. Okay. <laughs> so not helpful, not helpful. <laughs> not helpful at all. Oh. So so all I can say if you go out there water up good <laughs> luck <laughs> exactly and lots good of luck because you're gonna need it out yes. there yeah all right so question four what was Arizona's most wealthy madam she ran a brothel in jerome at the turn of the 20th century yeah and who was that jenny bowders yeah she's also known um as belgian jenny because she came from belgium she was born in 1862 um, and when she was 20, uh, she gave birth to a um, son, Joseph Philip, uh, and they came here to the United States. Um, they arrived on Ellis Island on July 6th, 1896, and they were headed for Chicago. Um, but after living in Chicago for a short while, uh, Jenny was, she was over it. She's like, I gotta, I gotta do something more adventurous. So she actually left her son with a church in Chicago and she took off for Jerome. Um, and at that time, Jerome was just coming up. It was gonna be a booming mining town. Everybody knew about it, Wild West, come on out and get rich sort of thing. Um, so she came out and coming to the West as a single woman or as a woman in general, um, she was gonna have a hard time up front just being one, an immigrant, two, a woman, and three, an unmarried woman. Um, but despite all of that, she was able to secure a mortgage and she purchased three parcels of land uh, in Jerome proper. And on paper, she um, said that these uh, properties were going to be boarding houses for women. Um, but in reality, they were brothels and she named these Jenny's Place. Um, she also opened up a saloon and she was the only woman in Jerome to own a saloon. She was known as a super gutsy, smart businesswoman, but also really kind hearted and a very, very compassionate um, person. So her time in Jerome, she lost her buildings three different times due to fires because fire was not an uncommon thing um, to, you know, spark right. and then, you know, a whole town's burned down. So um, her brothels burned down Christmas Eve of 1897. September 11th, 1898, and then April 21st in 1899. So that's a gnarly three years of burning and rebuilding. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but shortly thereafter, uh, the violence in Jerome got to be a little bit too much for her, and so she decided to leave. Um, and in 1903, she moved to um, Gold Road, uh, or otherwise known now today as Acme, Arizona. Um, 23 miles. Oh, up. okay. Yeah. And that was at that time in the early 1900s, a new mining boom town. So she was just going to take her business there. Um, and that is what she did. Um, the only difference this time was that she had a man following her. Um, his name was Clement Lee. Um, and he claimed to be her husband, though they were never actually married. And it's theorized that he was simply an opportunist who was just trying to 
get in on her money. Um, oh. And unfortunately, uh, one day in a drunken stupor, uh, he paid a visit to her house and he demanded money from her. And when she refused, uh, he shot her. Um, and he shot her outside of her house publicly. And it is written down, it is documented that, so she ran out of the house after he shot her. Um, she was screaming, please don't shoot me, please don't shoot me. He shot her twice more once she was outside. Um, and then when he realized that she wasn't dead, he shot her again. And then he proceeded to attempt to kill himself. He shot himself in the chest, um, but he did not die that day. So he was tried for murder um, and he was found guilty and then he uh, was hung. So that's a pretty gnarly story. Um, <laughs> Indeed. And so that now really explains the name of the beer. Yes. Madam's Revenge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and actually I have, let me read to you. So um, the story on the side of the Madam's Revenge can. Um, so all of these stories are um, supposed to be excerpts from Hans's, um, our fictional forefather's uh, journal as he's traveling through the West. So this is all in his voice. Um, so this is his excerpt about Jenny. I recently heard a haunting tale about a brothel where a successful madam from Belgium was shot by her man for cash. He shot her again, but she was still alive. He went back into a saloon to reload and she screamed for help. No one assisted her. He came back and shot her dead a third time. Now people in this town put cotton in their ears around sunset so they do not hear her screams. They all fear her revenge. Yeah. That's a good one. I like that one a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. All right. What is the name of the Apache medicine man who was the last American Indian to surrender to the U.S.? Yeah, so this is Geronimo. Um, so Geronimo was a prominent leader for the Apache people. Um, around 1850 to 1886, um, he had many members of various Apache um, groups throughout the Southwest um, gathered together and follow him. And then they went and they raided um, and fought against uh, Mexican and U.S. military campaigns. Um, he led breakouts from reservations for people that were told they had to stay put. Um, the lifestyle of the Apache people was very nomadic. So he was trying to get those people back into their culture and their traditional ways. Um, However, while he was a super well-known person, he was not a chief, so that's important to note. Um, and uh, in 1886 was when he finally surrendered, gave up everything, all of the rating, all of that, um, to Lieutenant Charles Bear Gatewood. Um, Geronimo and 27 other people were taken in at that time, um, and they were held prisoner. And uh, while he was a prisoner of state, um, the U.S. government capitalized on displaying him at various fairs and exhibitions. Um, so he was exhibited at the Trans-Mississippi and International Exhibition in Omaha, Nebraska. And he was also at the inauguration parade for uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and he died in Oklahoma at the Fort Sill Hospital in 1909. And uh, that is where he is buried. Ah, okay. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing story. Very interesting life he led for sure. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, I, I have you, have you ever done the Chiricahuas? No. Which is where was, was, was hiding spots down in Southern Arizona. And it's really cool. Um, just the way the rocks have formed are almost like totem poles in their own right. And just oh, these beautiful. big stacks of rocks. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Beautiful. So, yeah. yeah. All right, so what was the name of Arizona's first brewery built way back in 1864? Yeah, yeah, so um, Arizona's first brewery was called Park, Park Brewery. Um, so in the mid 19th century, um, 
Western United States was attracting thousands of people looking, you know, to have a fresh start, which is kind of the story of all of the people we've talked about thus far. Um, and a common way uh, to make money would be to work on railroads or also mining. Um, and these people needed a place to relax, recoup, and enjoy and socialize themselves. So um, entrepreneurs were very conscious of creating saloons and breweries at that time. Um, so the gentleman that started Park Brewery, his name is Alex Levin, and he saw this opportunity um, in now Pima County, Arizona, um, in a town that had varying names, uh, Horseshoe, Logan City, or Kigotoa, I think is how you say that. Um, and he was aiming to build a brewery and a dance hall. Um, However, after the Transcontinental Railroad um, was finished and it came out this way, that led out-of-state beers to be more readily available, and his small business couldn't keep up with the demand of um, oh. So, yeah, he had to close. So Park Brewery didn't really see much success, but it was the first ever Arizona brewery. So. Wow. And then there was a little thing called Prohibition, which yeah. suddenly made beer and other alcohol supposedly illegal to yes. purchase. Yeah, but, Prohibition was hard for anyone in the alcohol business. <laughs> indeed. So what was the name of the first brewery in Arizona after Prohibition? So post-Prohibition, Arizona Brewing Company was born. Um, so the repeal of Prohibition happened in 1933. And then people went crazy. They could start their businesses again. They didn't have to, you know, make bathtub gin or brew beer in the basement and not talk about it. Um, and so Arizona Brewing Company was born on May 6th, 1933, uh, by brothers uh, Martin and Herman Fenster. Um, this brewery was located at 1143 East Madison Street in Phoenix, uh, and it was a 34,000 square foot building. Um, in the beginning, they were only making about 15,000 barrels per year, um, but in their heyday, they were making over 250,000 barrels per year um, in the 40s and in the 50s. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of beer. It's a lot of beer. You know, people are thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Especially out here in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what was the name of the Pilsner beer that they mass produced at so Arizona a, Brewing Company? A1 Premium was the name of their flagship beer. Um, and this was a very popular beer at the time, um, that style at least. Um, so it was a smart choice by them. Nice, clean, crisp, fresh, easy to drink in the heat. Um, so well done by them. Um, they became so popular because they were super creative with their, their marketing campaigns. So they decided to promote that their beer was the best by entering it in international competitions, which is actually pretty smart. Um, so this beer won many international awards. Um, so for five consecutive years, A1 Beer received the Cross of Honor in Brussels. Um, it received the Star wow. of Excellence in Luxembourg um, and also in Antwerp. So Luxembourg was in 1951, Antwerp was in 1952, and, and in Paris in 1953. And then finally, it won the Premium Quality Medal of Leadership Award in Munich in 1954. So they used this slogan to sell the beer called Judged at the Finest, um, and that made it seem like a very prestigious, well-respected beer. Um, they were also super smart in that they sponsored sports teams. So the Phoenix Suns, they sponsored the Phoenix Suns, various uh, baseball teams that came here for spring training in the 50s and 60s, they sponsored them. Um, and they had they were known for having these big retail displays at grocery stores i think there was a picture of that just a second ago um and the slide there um and you guys will notice in those pictures um that there is an eagle um there's a, a neon sign there in the middle you can see on there that there's a an eagle on that and actually budweiser attempted to sue the arizona brewing company for using the eagle in their logo 
Um, but they lost that lawsuit, surprisingly. Uh, the trademark um, uh, office said that the eagle was too common of a symbol to say that you own it. So that was good for them because that could have really destroyed their business. Um, well, and then, and then also, it was like when you bought a case of beer, you got art. Yeah. So, um, Lon McGargy, who was an Arizona artist, um, did a variety of he kind of manipulated some of his paintings for A One, and so those are very collectible today, as well as almost any A One memorabilia. Yes, very much so. Um, in doing research for this talk today. I actually found a website, the Arizona Brewing Company website that is still active and they have lots of merchandise and memorabilia and things. And I couldn't quite make out if they still sell the beer. Um, I actually attempted to reach out to them to try to see, to talk to them about it, but I didn't, uh, I didn't get so, it. Out so from my understanding, so there was a, I want to say it was a brewery in Tucson who's, who had the rights to the name and something happened and so i think it's kind of in litigation okay so right now it's not actually being used as a name of a beer okay yeah I, but i, I mean it was gather that from the website it was very you know it didn't say anything explicit um so i wasn't sure but yeah, yeah it was a short time period of time where it was out there and then it wasn't and then now nobody knows hmm. but, well, that's, that's but interesting. i hope it comes back because that's pretty cool cultural thing right i mean it was like yeah i mean it was such a part of arizona history yeah um year, years ago i was watching a friend's family movies and they were up in prescott and during the rodeo parade there is um this guy riding a horse and on the back of it it says a1 ah on the back quarter of the horse cool. so yeah yeah so is indeed part of our cultural heritage. Yes. With yeah. So, you know, so cheers to that. Cheers, cheers to, to cultural that. history. Yes. <laughs> Arizona beer. And keeping it local. Yes. All right. So what was the most common style of beer served in saloons in the eight, in 1870s here in Arizona? Yeah. So lager beer would have been the most popular beer across the United States, really. And the reason for that is because German immigrants coming brought coming here to the States brought their brewing traditions with them. And Germans are world famous for making lagers. So they would have been using every, all of their um, recipes to make large scale batch beers. And they were very popular. Uh, that's Basically, the beginning of American beer is German immigrants creating lagers and that slowly moving across the United States. Wow. Yeah. So, okay, so if there's all this beer, you know, that really kind of begs the question. So how did saloons store their beer? Because yes. nobody had refrigeration. I mean, you, you had to go get a block of ice from somewhere. Right. Yeah. So, and especially out here um, in the Phoenix area or Southern Arizona in general, um, it would be different, you know, up North where they do get snow and things like that, but there really wasn't anywhere to get ice. I mean, so to create a refrigerator, you would go to the local lake, grab a chunk of ice, dig a hole in the ground or put it in the basement somewhere or something and leave it there. We don't have that. We, that's not possible here in the Phoenix Valley or in Southern Arizona. So people had to drink beer at room temperature, believe it or not. Um, and that actually wasn't really all that uncommon. Um, traditionally in Europe, uh, beer was and still is mm. in some places served room temperature. So beer would have been kept in barrels and either the saloon or brewery would pour directly from those barrels and they would uh, be kept on site or maybe at an offsite storage. Probably smaller batches were being made um, because, you know, you don't want the beer to go bad. You want to consume it as quickly as it's made. So yeah, you would have had a super warm, uh, probably pretty flat beer coming out of a barrel. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Mm, doesn't that sound tasty? I know, right? Yeah, we're so spoiled now. But <laughs> uh, another interesting um, fact about beer in general, and this applies to all ancient cultures and large cities back before sanitation was really a thing and understanding microbes and water and stuff, beer was safer to drink generally than the water population in um, your city. So uh, people would have been consuming a lot more beer than what we think, not necessarily for enjoyment of consuming alcohol, but to get their water intake. Is better than dysentery. It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, wow, that was fascinating. So now, so now, okay, so now we're done with trivia. So I always like to ask people how they did, just because, you know, as you're sitting there guessing, it's always kind of fun just to kind of have a, a litmus test. Yeah. But I, al I always tell people, you know, regardless, you're still a winner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, I mean, look at these great stories. Yeah. And now you've got all that much more pub trivia knowledge after knowing the answers and hearing the stories. So, and yeah, ex exactly. And, you know, it was so funny, I think, um, getting ready for this, talking to friends about it and having no idea where Bonehouse Brewery was. So I think we should plan an excursion to Fountain Hills oh, and yeah. invite folks to come out to Bonehouse Brewery and then do like, because we know it's a, a dark city and then go out and do a little walk. I think that would be so much fun. So Rachel, would you be up for that? Absolutely. I would love right. that. So everybody, if you, if you're interested in that chime in and you know, cause I think we might even be able to get the mayor, Jenny Dickey, who, who is, who's been a guest before. And we kind of talked about trying to do some of something like this, but I think it would be so much fun to get a group of folks to just come and experience Fountain Hills. Yes. Experience Fountain Hills, experience some good local beer, and coming into the tap room, for those of you who have not been here to the Bonehouse, it is an experience all within itself. And we have history literally plastered all over the walls. There are stories to be told and to be learned about all over the place. So it will be a super... Uh, educational and fun and delicious time so indeed so rachel cheers oh i see you got ahead of me <laughs> I, I still got some left don't worry see ah okay very good <laughs> there we go well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and talking about bonehouse brewery so um let's figure out a date and we'll let people know when they can come out and we'll have a little adventure Sounds awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a great rest of your night. You too. Hey, everybody. Marshall Shore, Arizona's hip historian, and I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. But, you know, we did pre-record this, but we had so much fun that we have decided with Bonehouse Brewery, we are going to do a little Fountain Hills experience. So on Saturday, May 21st at 7.30, we're going to gather in front of the Euro Pizza Cafe, do a walk around the lake and fountain, and then go hang out at Bone House Brewery. So there'll be more information coming out on Facebook and Instagram and other sources. See you soon. All right. Wow. That was so much fun. All right, so now we're getting ready for From the Vault, which is kind of hidden history. And I thought since we were talking about beer history, it might be kind of fun to talk about, oops, wrong direction, up in Prescott, the oldest bar in Arizona. So back in, up in Prescott in 1870, the Palace Restaurant and Saloon opened its doors. And it was so much more than just a watering hole. It was a place for elections. You had, that was the gathering place for men. They could find out about jobs there. It really became kind of the hub of the community. You could even bring in your mineral claims and they would be sold at the bar accordingly and you would get some money. So in 1900, the bar caught fire 
in the famous Whiskey Row Blaze up in Prescott. Patrons of the bar loved the bar so much that they actually picked it up and carried it out. It was an original Brunswick bar, and so they wanted to save it. And it was stored until it could be brought back safely. And that is the same bar that they use today. So you can go have a bite to eat, have a beverage, and you can do it on an, a really, the oldest bar in Arizona, which I think is really cool. So I think I'm going to go up there and do exactly that at some point. So now you'll see why I always say, you know, if you're watching this, now you know why on Facebook you should click that little share button because look at how much fun we're having with Arizona history. And, you know, I will say, and cheers to that. So next week we have Ron Tang. His family had an import store here, which some of you might remember. And that's going to be such a fun show. So be sure and check in with us next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thursday night, 7 o'clock. I'll be here. I will see you then. Now, as we get ready to close out, I always like to say, you know, if you weren't able to, if you didn't get into the chat session or you wanted to do something else, say something else. You know, please let me know because I indeed I love to hear from you. And I always love to give a big shout out to Chris and Cole who did that great video that we started with, as well as PJ. I mean, I think you took a vacation this week because he just said, Bonehouse Brewery, they'll take care of you. And indeed they did. So we'll see what he comes up with for next week. Oh, I could hardly wait. It's going to be so much fun. So as we get ready to say good night, I am going to leave you. So, you know, because things are now blooming, we're going to have a little commercial about your sinuses. When hay fever pollen invades your sinuses, brings runny nose, watery eyes, take Dristan. Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Yes, Dristan's like... Sending your sinuses to Arizona. That is, Dristan helps you breathe free and easy, as if you were far away from pollen or allergy irritation. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Helps dry, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes. You see, Dristan tablets shrink swollen, congested nasal and sinus passages, which cause runny nose and watery eyes. So you breathe free and easy fast. So when pollen invades your sinuses, causing hay fever miseries, don't wish you could be in sunny, dry Arizona. Just remember, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Get Dristan decongestant tablets.